workers. The town's response was way too slow, and that's why things have ended up this way. They said it was safe and there was nothing to worry about, and I trusted them completely. Offshore, the aircraft carrier USS Ronald Reagan moved farther out to sea after three of its helicopters flew into a low-level radiation plume 60 miles from the coast. But even without the radiation worries, there are still growing concerns over shortages of water, food, and power. In Sendai, closer to the quake's epicenter, grocery stores remained shut. My family and friends are all gathered together in one house. But now we're running out of food, so I'm starting to worry. There were long, orderly lines for Red Cross water tankers to dispense drinking water. While lines for gasoline stretched city blocks, the stations that still had supplies were limiting drivers to the equivalent of $2 worth of fuel. Financial markets were rocked as well by a broad sell-off today amid fears of economic fallout. The widespread power shortages have halted production at Toyota plants and other factories around the country. Meanwhile, the Japanese government has sent 100,000 troops to lead the relief effort. And at the government's request, the U.S. sent two 75-person urban search and rescue teams, each with six dogs trained to detect live victims. President Obama again stressed the U.S. commitment today. I've said directly to the Prime Minister of Japan, Prime Minister Khan, uh, that the United States will continue to offer any assistance we can as Japan recovers from multiple disasters. Overall, more than 90 nations have offered Japan assistance. 15 of them are expected to send rescue crews within the next few days. The scope of Japan's suffering is being told in towns that dot the coast, and each has its own story of loss without reckoning. One such place is Rikuzen Takata, where James Mates has the first of a series of reports from independent television news. We'll tell you that this is the town of Rikusen Takata. Your eyes will tell you something very different. Because Rikusen Takata, home just 72 hours ago to almost 30,000 people, has been wiped from the face of the earth. The tsunami came, destroyed everything in its path, and then took much of what it had destroyed back out to sea. The rest it left heaped and splintered, almost nothing built by man was spared. What happened here is almost beyond description. It seems that an entire town, a thriving coastal community, has been picked up, smashed to matchwood, and then dumped a mile or so up the valley from where it started. I'm standing on what I think is a piece of wall, but it is on top of cars, and they are on top of bits of roof. We know that all this happened within an hour or so of that first earthquake. It doesn't bear thinking about how many people would not have had time to get away. <laughs> These are people who rarely show emotion in public, but stoicism at this time is too hard. They search through the lists of names posted on boards in refuges and evacuation centers of those who are known to be safe. Across the room, survivors have posted handwritten messages on walls asking family, friends, former neighbors to get in touch if somehow they have made it. In a school gym, the homeless of Rickard Santacata wait patiently for evacuation. There will be no going home. My family is mother and sister and me, but my mother mm, lost. Your mother is lost. I'm, lost. I'm very sorry. These people lived because they were out of town as the tsunami struck, or because they got lucky in the scramble to escape, or like this family, because they happened to live on higher ground. It was a large earthquake, she told me, but where we were, we felt safe. But when I looked down, I saw the roads in town were jammed with cars, and that's why I think there were so few survivors. As we'd been filming inside the evacuation center, rescue workers had recovered another body from the debris. They have long since given up searching for survivors here. Finding the dead and preventing the spread of disease is all they're concerned with now. Minami Sanriku was one of the first to be reached, but perhaps the hardest hit of all, the town where 10,000 are still unaccounted for. They have now found 1,000 bodies here, ambulances making regular trips in and out today to collect them. Another 1,000 have been recovered from the shoreline nearby. Tsunami, tsunami, tsunami. 
Every day there are aftershocks and with each one a threat of a new tsunami. Today an alert from Japan's meteorological agency sent rescue workers and police scurrying to higher ground. A change in wind direction and an all clear on the tsunami alert allowed us to leave Minami Senraku. As we left we found Kudo Shinsuke standing on the concrete foundations of what had once been his house. His family was okay, he told us. We had a vehicle waiting and a hotel to go to. He no longer had a possession in the world. Alex Thompson has our next report. He's just down the coast in the fishing port of Kesanuma. Much of the town and its central business district now lie in ruins. The port of Kesanuma this afternoon. The cries of distant crows, the loudest noise that you can hear. The town's giant tuna fishing fleet stranded where the ebbing tsunami had left them all over this town. People are coming back here. They can't quite take it in. Last Friday afternoon, minutes before the tsunami, the town's tuna fleet weren't anywhere near here. They were at anchor right out in the bay. But the damage done to the tuna fishing industry and these vessels is as nothing compared to the damage in some ways that was inflicted by the boats and the tsunami right here. Suddenly there's a man running through the rubble looking for his lost father. <laughs> then we find his dad. It, it's his house, here. His house? Where? There's just a puddle. But it turns out this was his house. And what was this? What was this? Hmm? My house. Yasuo Matsumoto, a businessman, looks like he's been crying for several days. He won't forget last Friday. All at once, this wave just came towards us. I've never seen anything like it. From down low, like this, you couldn't outrun it. It must have, it must have been terrifying. Quite terrifying. You felt your time had come. Ships capsized, dumped across the town. Many of them burnt out, at least one still smoldering. Across the bay, helicopters are flying relays round the clock to deal with a forest fire on the island across the sound. The quakes ruptured every fuel tank for miles here, starting intense fires, including this one now spreading across this island. This small tender, the only boat that's working to get the firefighters in and frighten residents out. This woman had been stuck there for three days and the blaze is spreading. The only information we're getting is from relatives and some men on the island. They say people have been swept away and their houses are gone. While some towns are obliterated along this coast, here it's an entire port, an entire sector of industry simply taken out. And there's Yasuo Matsumoto's grandchildren, two of the 14 who lived where now there's just a puddle, foundations, and a stranded fishing fleet. In addition to the thousands of dead in Japan, untold numbers are injured. Angus Walker is in Ishinomaki, where a hospital is trying to cope with human suffering beyond imagining. Four days on, and they're still finding bodies. This was a small town. 15 miles inland. As the corpse of the elderly man was taken away, a sergeant told me his unit needed food and water. If the army needs supplies, what hope is there for anyone else?
Until Friday, this was one of Ashinomaki's quiet district hospitals. Now, camp beds fill the corridors. It's mainly the elderly who are suffering the most. Look into the eyes of this 92-year-old woman. 26 when the atom bombs were dropped on Japan. Did she ever expect nature to match the destructive force of war? Severe damage to the roads along Japan's northeastern coast mean it's very difficult to get aid to the victims of this disaster. And look at this, the force of the earthquake has flung pieces of tarmac like playing cards. 26-year-old Shimutsu Yasuhiro, his wife and friends had just waded out of their village. He cradled his 10-day-old daughter. What's the name of the baby? Lucky this. Lucky? She's lucky to be alive. Now to the efforts to alleviate the suffering and provide aid to the tsunami victims. First from Japan, I talked by Skype with Casey Kalamusa in Tokyo. He's an official with the humanitarian aid group World Vision. Casey, welcome. What do people need most right now, and can you get it to them? Well, that's a good question. Um, the, our assessment teams have been in Sendai the last day, um, and they basically found out that what's, what's to be expected, the, the most needed items right now are food, water, temporary shelter, and clothing. What kind of physical footprint are we talking about for the places in the most dire need right now? It's, it's been hard to get an idea of the size of the affected area that we're talking about. One of the things that, that perhaps isn't made clear is how difficult it is to even reach this, these populations that have been um, stranded and cut off now. Uh, the roads have been washed out. There have been cars turned over and, and washed onto the highways. Um, trees have been uprooted and blown over. So it's, it's almost impossible in a lot of cases to get anywhere by car. You need to be airlifted in. It's still a pretty cold time of the year in northern Japan. Have people been finding places to congregate, to get in and out of the elements in the area where the destruction was the worst? There have been community shelters opening up at, at churches and schools and community centers. And so there have been mass evacuations to those areas where they've been staying. And that's one of the things that World Vision's working on as well as is in this initial distribution. We brought in jackets for babies, simply realizing how vulnerable they are to the cold. When people congregate, is it easier to get them food and water? Certainly, it does. When you have a population that's spread out, then it's going to make it much harder to target them and, and reach them in, in mass numbers. So, in a sense, that, is, that does help for the aid uh, distributions that they are all in one place or gathered together. But right now, the challenge is simply getting to them and then also uh, what we're going to do medium to long term. Thanks a lot, Casey. Good to talk to you. Thanks for having me. Now to United Nations efforts to bring international relief to Japan. Catherine Bragg is the Assistant Secretary General for the, for the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs. Ms. Bragg, has Japan made specific requests for aid? What have they been asking for? Uh, Japan is actually a very well-prepared and well-resourced country when it comes to di disaster response. Um, so they have uh, uh, the response effort very much in hand and, and, and have been doing heroic work in, in, in that respect. But there are certain areas where the United Nations has a, a uh, particular role to play. Uh, in the early days uh, after a disaster like this, search and rescue is uh, the, the, the most important part. And part of what we can do and what the, the Japanese government has requested of the United Nations is to help coordinate the international search and rescue teams that are coming into the country. At the moment, uh, the uh, government of Japan has accepted uh, search and rescue teams from 15 countries. And there are at least another 17 countries on standby at, uh, status at the moment, and at least another 40 others who have also offered to send search and rescue teams. So the coordination of all of this is something that the United Nations can do uh, for, for the government and for the people of Japan. Um, the United Nations also uh, helps to put out the, the humanitarian information for the, for the, the, the use of and, and for the information of anyone who is interested in from, from a humanitarian point of view. Uh, so we have been putting out a uh, situation report from uh, Saturday morning, uh, which is the second day after the, uh, 
uh, the, the, the earthquake, and we have been doing uh, a daily situation re report so that uh, for any parties who are interested in the uh, situation from a humanitarian point of view, such as where the gaps are. Uh, in terms of fulfilling the, uh, the the needs of the survivors, uh, what where are the the uh, uh, what are the extent of uh, uh, of the uh, um, evacuation? Uh, that can be found in uh, the the uh, information products that we that we put out. Earlier in the program, it's been reported on several occasions how difficult it is to get around the country. With those international search and res rescue teams, can you get your assets into Japan? And into the uh, yes, affected they areas. Are. Uh, uh, yes, they are, and 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 part of uh, what international search and rescue teams have to do is that they have to be self-sufficient. Uh, uh, so they they will be bringing in all of their own equipments, uh, including uh, uh, the search and rescue dogs as well. There there are a number of dogs that are with the with the teams. Uh, and uh, they will be uh, uh, be be getting it. They they have been getting into the area, and 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 have been assisting with the uh, with the search and rescue. Uh, the uh, the airport at Sunday at the moment is 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 gradually opening. Is it made more complicated your work by the problems with the radiation? There have been several releases. People are being evacuated from affected areas. Do you not only have to worry about that for the people you're going to help, but for the rescue workers themselves? Well, of, of course, we are concerned, just, just as everybody. Uh, we have to remember this is actually a uh, triple l level of disasters. We, we have both the effect of the earthquake, we have the effect of the, the aftermath of the tsunami, and, and now with the, uh, the nuclear threat as well. Uh, so, um, for, so this is not like in any other situations, um, comparable situations that, that we can think of. This is not like Haiti uh, last year, uh, not even like um, the tsunami in 2004. Uh, so, so it is a, a, a bit of a different situation that we, we, we have to deal with. But at the moment, uh, our understanding is that the level of radiation is uh, not at the, to the level that is of concern yet that we would be withdrawing uh, aid workers from, from, from the area. We, of course, are monitoring uh, the reports uh, are from both the government and the uh, International Atomic Energy Agency as to uh, uh, well, what is the level of risks. And, and at this point, our understanding is that, there, that, um, that there has, it has not reached that level where we would be withdrawing uh, uh, humanitarian workers from, from the area. In many other disasters, if you locate affected people, stabilize them, help them out, your work is done. But here, shocks and maybe subsequent tsunamis, do you also have to move them to some place where they're no longer vulnerable? Uh, m most of those evacuated and the survivors um, are in um, evacuation centers, uh, in about over 2,000 evacuation centers. As I mentioned before, Japan is a very, very well-prepared country for this. this. This is the sort of disaster scenarios that they have been rehearsing for years. Uh, so it is true that uh, um, the, the, both the rescue and the relief efforts are constantly being hampered by uh, aftershocks and also tsunami warnings and, and the like. Uh, it is part of the, uh, of, of, of the context of how uh, aid can, can reach the people. UN Assistant Secretary General Catherine Bragg, thanks for joining us. You're most welcome. My pleasure. Coming up, more on the status of Japan's nuclear power plants, plus Saudi Arabia sends troops into Bahrain. But first, with the other news of the day, here is Kwame Holman. Libyan leader Muammar Gaddafi pressed his assault on rebel-held towns today. In the east, government planes carried out new airstrikes on Ajdabia, and the larger city of Benghazi lay ahead. We have a report from Bill Neely of Independent Television News. Gaddafi's men are on the road to Benghazi and the rebels are on the run. Just days ago and for a hundred miles around, this was in rebel hands. Not anymore. Gaddafi's state television has been showing off his latest prize, the oil town of Brega. This complex provides electricity to the rebel capital, Benghazi. Gaddafi could now cut its power. His men simply outgunned the rebels, retaking the oil towns with artillery, tanks and planes, capturing 150 miles in days. 
The rebels say their retreat is strategic and they had simply advanced too far, too fast. The hospital at Ras Lanouf was abandoned quickly. This is it just five days ago, filled with injured rebel fighters and with their dreams of freedom and of toppling Gaddafi. The dreams, like the fighters, are gone. The hospital is deserted. Gaddafi's army spokesman says the rebels are al-Qaeda terrorists. I asked him if he's now planning to attack Benghazi. To deal with them, you don't need really a full-scale military action. But that's exactly what Gaddafi does. This is Zawiya just hours after it was taken. This is what Benghazi can expect. Gaddafi's onslaught ferocious. One of his crack brigades in the vanguard. Dozens of troops sacrificed. Dozens of civilians reported killed by indiscriminate fire. This town was bombarded for seven straight days by tanks, by artillery, by the very best Gaddafi could throw at it. And you can see burnt out cars, rocket propelled grenade and bullet holes in the buildings here. Zawiya was crushed ruthlessly. Gaddafi's men have Benghazi in their sights. The revolution is on its knees. Government forces also used tanks to recapture the small western town of Zuwara today. And at the UN, the Security Council discussed imposing a no-fly zone, but reached no consensus. In Afghanistan, a suicide bombing killed 35 people today at a military recruiting center. Afghan officials said the bomber targeted a building in Kunduz province. He blew himself up in the crowd outside. The Taliban claimed responsibility. The group attacked the same recruiting site last December. Security forces also were targeted in eastern Iraq. At least 10 Iraqi soldiers died when a bomber detonated a car laden with explosives. It happened outside the headquarters of an army intelligence battalion northeast of Baghdad. At least 30 people were wounded in the bombing. The High Court in Lahore, Pakistan, delayed a ruling today on whether an American jailed there has diplomatic immunity. Raymond Davis is accused of killing two Pakistanis. He was working for the CIA at the time. The immunity issue now goes to the trial court, set to convene on Wednesday. The U.S. State Department has lost its chief spokesman over the WikiLeaks case. P.J. Crowley resigned Sunday after saying the military's treatment of Army PFC Bradley Manning was ridiculous and counterproductive and stupid. Manning is accused of leaking hundreds of thousands of documents. He's being held in solitary confinement, and at night he was being stripped and made to wear a suicide-proof smock. The events in Japan will not change U.S. plans for more nuclear energy. A White House spokesman said today it remains part of the president's overall energy plan. But several European countries began reassessing. Switzerland suspended plans to replace old nuclear plants with new ones, and Germany delayed a decision on extending the life of its nuclear plants. We want to form an independent investigating commission with the task of undertaking a new risk analysis of all German nuclear power plants. This based on currently available information about events in Japan, especially looking at the security of the cooling systems. At least 195 nuclear power plants are operating throughout Europe. Of 19 plants under construction in Europe and Asia, most are being built in Russia. On Wall Street today, stocks fell amid concerns over the economic effects of the Japanese earthquake and tsunami. The Dow Jones Industrial Average lost 51 points to close at 11,993. The Nasdaq fell 14 points to close at 2,701. President Obama asked Congress today to revamp the nation's main education law before the new school year begins in September. Republicans and Democrats agree that no child left behind needs revising, but they disagree on the federal role in education. The president said he wants changes to support innovation and target more funding on schools where students are doing poorly. Those are some of the day's major stories. Now back to Gwen. We take a closer look now at some of the questions raised about the state of Japan's damaged nuclear reactors. I'm joined by NewsHour science correspondent Miles O'Brien and David Brenner, director of the Center for Radiological Research at Columbia University. Gentlemen, welcome. Miles, I'll start with you. What is typical? What is supposed to happen in inside of a nuclear reactor like this? And what's happening in Japan right now? Yeah, let's do a little bit of boiling water reactor 101, yeah. shall we? Let's go, go and look at a little graphic here and help people understand. We've heard them talk 
about the fuel rods, for example. These are shafts of zirconium. Inside are little pellets of uranium that are encased in ceramic. Those rods go inside this reactor primary containment vessel. That's kind of the last line of defense. You don't want that ever to breach. And we should be very clear that we have no indication that those primary containment vessels at those three stricken plants, uh, reactors in uh, Japan, have been breached at all. Now, what happens is uh, these uh, uh, rely on water for cooling, and these rods need to be bathed in water. When there's a, a seismic activity, when there's a, a, some sort of earthquake, an accelerometer immediately begins what's called a SCRAM, interesting acronym. It shuts down the plant in a quick manner, and you need additional power, auxiliary power, in order to keep the water over those fuel rods and keep them cool enough. Now, let's look at the next line of defense, which is an important point as well, because this is what has been breached in those two explosions. The reactor's inside, the primary containment vessel, and then there's that secondary containment vessel. What happened in this case was there was venting of hydrogen into the secondary structure. Think Hindenburg for just a moment. A spark and an explosion occurs, and that is where we've seen uh, very likely most of the release of the radioactive. We've seen re uh, release of cesium, release of iodine. We'll show you an image, by the way. This comes from uh, Digital Globe, which gives you an idea. On the left-hand side of the picture, that's uh, uh, one of the vessels which is still contained, and in the middle, you see one that has had the explosion because of the hydrogen uh, which exploded. So at this once, point, once again, that's the roof and the walls, but not the containment. Exactly. The nuclear Just to be clear, itself. that primary containment vessel remains intact. That's very important. So w when we talk about this kind of, we t use the term meltdown very loosely as we talk about yeah. things like this. Do we have any indication of degree of damage was, that has been done when these, we t use the term meltdown very loosely as we talk about yeah. things like this. Do we have any indication of degree of damage was that has been done when these rods were uncovered by water? Well, I've, I've talked to quite a few experts today, and what they tell you is that some things have melted. The question is, has the fuel itself melted? Probably the rods, there's zirconium have. As a matter of fact, there's no doubt about that. But has it reached the point where the fuel begins melting and becomes this molten mass, which creates that scenario we've heard in the movies, the, the China syndrome. I don't know what you call it on this side of the planet, the, the Cleveland syndrome or something, whatever the case may be. In theory, it becomes so hot that it would melt its way out of this primary containment chamber. We haven't seen that yet, but this is still a very tense time. They're pouring in seawater into these vessels as best they can to keep it cool. Now, that means they've written off these plants. You'll never be able to use them again. The seawater is modulated with boron to make sure the neurons aren't active. And that means the plants are a write-off. And uh, the question is, can they continue keeping the seawater in at a proper level to keep the temperatures safe? And is what we just saw in those pictures, is that what we have here in the United States? Is it the same kind of set up? Well, basically our structures are a little beefier than this. And, and one important point which I should tell everybody is that the, the diesel fuel tanks for the auxiliary generators which keep the, the, the water pumping are all buried here in the United States. These tanks were above ground for reasons that a lot of engineers can't fully understand. This is, after all, a seismically active area, the ring of fire. And the Japanese, after all, invented the term tsunami. So the fact that they had fuel tanks of diesel to run these generators, this last resort generator above ground, has people mystified. And without the power, you can't keep it cool, and that's the problem we're facing tonight. Yes, I want to turn right. to David Brenner and, and ask for your assessment of how serious a situation is this potentially? Well, uh, it's, it's very hard, really, at this point in time to give a clear answer to that question. We, we have some parameters that we can think about. And there have been two major uh, nuclear power plant disasters in, in the world. Uh, there was the one in this country at Three Mile Island. There was the one at uh, Chernobyl in, in the old Soviet Union. And just to put perspective on those two, uh, Chernobyl was the equivalent of a million Three Mile Islands. So really the question is, are we closer to a Three Mile Island situation or are we closer to a Chernobyl situation? And what's the answer to I that think question? The answer, yeah, go ahead. I think, I think the answer to that question is clearly that we're closer to a Chernobyl situation. And if the, the event was to stop right now, um, I'm sorry, I said that exactly wrong. We're clearly closer to a Three Mile Island situation. Uh, if, if, the, uh, if the incident was to stop right now, the amount of radioactive releases is really very small, and the risk to the general population, uh, just like it was in Three Mile Island, 
would be uh, very small indeed. Now, understanding that you, we await I'm sorry, pardon me. Understanding that you don't, we don't, none of us know tonight exactly how much radiation may have been released. We have heard some reports, and we saw in some of the earlier tape pieces, pieces people being wanded and, and checked for radiation exposure. Uh, do we know, have any sense about how serious that might be? I think we have a good idea at this point in time that the radiation exposure to the general public, and now I'm not talking about the nuclear power workers, but to the general public at this point is clearly very small. Uh, the radiation risks uh, correspondingly are very small. Uh, the issue with the nuclear power workers, on the other hand, the people inside the plant is, is very different. I think there's pretty good evidence that there have been some high-dose exposures uh, to those folks, the, the folks mm -hmm. who are actually fighting the, uh, the situation inside and are trying to get the water into the uh, nuclear fuel. Uh, I think we know there are some high doses associated with those folks. One but for the general population, so far, I think the doses are low. One of these reactors went online in 1971. Is the age of the plant significant in this case? I think it is. I think it's actually key to the, uh, to the whole s scenario. Um, you know, that's 40 years ago. The actual lifetime of this uh, reactor was scheduled to be 25 years. And really what we see is, uh, as, as you've just heard, that the backup systems were really not as good as they should have been. And as time has gone on over the years, the newer uh, plants have better and better and, and more and more backup systems in place. This plant actually had only one backup system, the secondary uh, generators, and when they failed, there was nothing. And that's not the case with any modern nuclear reactor. So it is cru crucial that this was a 1971 machine. So as we look over, watch this for the next several days and watch to see whether the cores cool down, do, what are we looking for? What are the signs we're looking for to find out whether things are getting better or, or getting worse? Well, the, the, there are really two issues which are going to determine the, uh, the, the public health significance. And that's just how much uh, releases uh, we, we get in the next couple of days. And the other point, actually, is the wind. The wind is, is absolutely central here. Which way is the wind going to blow? And among all the awful things that are happening here, the one bright sign is that, uh, is that the wind is actually blowing offshore. So the wind is actually taking whatever radioactive materials are being uh, deposited in the uh, atmosphere and moving them offshore to the sea. Uh, we very much hope that uh, that meteorology actually continues and we continue to have offshore winds. That will really uh, ameliorate the whole situation. But it's the winds and how much radioactivity is actually emitted from these reactors. So give me a best case scenario and a worst case scenario. Well, the best case scenario is that uh, in the next day or so, they get, the, uh, um, they get enough water into the fuels, and um, there's very little more release than we have right now. And then we're going to be in a, basically a three-mile island uh, situation, where although there were releases, they were so small that there was uh, no good evidence of any uh, public health risks to, to the uh, surrounding population. So that's, that's the best case scenario. The worst case scenario is, in fact, that there, was, there is a significant uh, radioactive release in the next couple of days. And I think the next 48 hours is really crucial here. Um, we still hope that most of the plume will get blown to sea, but uh, the worst case scenario is that the wind would change and the plume is starting to uh, approach the, the population, which, as you know, has been evacuated some miles away now from the nuclear plant. Um, but still, the plume will reach the population if the wind is blowing in the right direction. Of course, and we'll be watching all of that. David Brenner, Columbia University, Miles O'Brien, of NewsHour science correspondent. Thank you both very much. This is Pledge Week on public television. We'll be back shortly with an update on the turmoil in Bahrain. This break allows your public television station to ask for your support. That support helps keep programs like ours on the air. We hear all the time from viewers and investors in the station that one of the things that they love about the news hour is that it's civil, that there is no yelling, that no matter how spirited the debate between people who are on opposite sides of an issue, there is a respect for each other and for you.